Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Charity Wallace, founder and president of Wallace Global Impact and our esteemed panel. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. We're so thrilled to be here, and I am really pleased to be able to moderate today's discussion on addressing economic drivers of migration, especially in the Northern Triangle and Southern Mexico. And I am here with three distinguished panelists. Thank you so much for joining me today. They all represent different sectors and interventions, but each one of them, in their own way, um, is focused on gender and the inclusion of women and gender in our economic um, empowerment and opportunity. And for those of you know, who know me, you know that I believe that that's the most critical piece to um, solutions for, for almost anything in the world. <laughs> so um, I am honored to be joined today by Dr. Rebecca Bill Chavez. Thank you so much. She is the president and CEO of Inter-American Dialogue. Carmen Correo, who is the CEO of ProMujer, and Hector Mujica, he's the head of economic opportunity at google.org. So Rebecca, I wanted to start with you. I know that you've spent most of your career focused on the Americas as an academic, in the government, at your, especially at the Department of Defense and, and the policy world, and then now at a think tank. And so I know that you've just recently been to the border and would love for you just to provide perspective on what you saw firsthand and what you think, are, you know, some of the largest drivers of migration. Thanks so much for the question, Charity, and I, I really appreciate it because of the focus on drivers. Um, I just, I guess I'd want to start just by framing it as, and I think everyone probably in this room knows that um, the decision to, to make the harrowing journey north, it's not, people don't come by that easily. Right. It's, it's um, this idea that this is, you know, that people just want to come. It's, it's, it's a lack of hope. It's a, I mean, just, it's, it's, the drivers are so key, and so the, one that, the ones that we hear most about are the, the pervasive poverty. Mm -hmm. We hear a lot about crime and violence as, as a driver, and we hear a lot about um, poor governance. Um, but I think it's really important to include the gender lens mm -hmm. and also the climate change lens when we're looking at migration from the Northern Triangle. So as far as the trip to the border, my first, the first thing, actually I, Hector and I had the opportunity to travel to um, McAllen, Texas, and to Reynosa, Mexico. Um, I think everyone, if you have the opportunity, should go. It's one thing to, to read about it, um, but it's, a, it's just a completely different thing to see it firsthand. Mm -hmm. um, what really struck me was just the numbers of women and girls at the border. And um, the proportion of women to men that are migrating from the Northern Triangle has doubled in the last few years. Um, and we're hearing, and one of the things that we heard at the border were just really heartbreaking stories about gender-based violence. Um, and we also heard a lot about the increase of, uh, in domestic violence um, during the pandemic as people were kind of on, on lockdown. One of the women we met, um, Katrina, for example, she, she sort of, she really, her story really stuck with me. She's from Honduras. She um, left with her two-year-old and she was pregnant at the time, but she really felt like she was gonna die if she stayed. Her boyfriend had been beating her to such a degree she thought she, he would kill her and um, you know, would, she, she was pregnant, lose the baby. So um, she endured just, incredible violence on the route um, to the United States. But her story was just, is was representative of so many that we heard. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think this kind of is a good segue into the work that Carmen and Hector are doing because there is an intersection mm -hmm. between economic empowerment and violence um, for women. Um, research shows that the greater the e economic opportunities that women, women have, the lower risk they are to um, when it comes to gender-based violence um, and in order to break free from, from the dependence. Um, and also, to, it allows them, just one thing, is to report <laughs> the violence. That's it goes right. way underreported. Um, right. yeah. So I think this is a good way, a good um, opportunity, because I'm, I'm very curious to hear what you two are doing yeah. together. Absolutely. It is, it's a great transition because, as you said, women are really at the center of a lot of these drivers for women are, develop, are economic development or an economic opportunity. Um, and it goes to what you're doing at Promujer, um, Carmen. You know, we know that women, um, if they're more fully 
integrated into the economic fabric, um, global GDP would go up. And in Latin America alone, $2.6 trillion by 2025 if the global gender gap was closed. Um, we know that you know the credit gap is enormous for women. Mm -hmm. um, it's over $320 billion globally. Women have a credit gap. And particularly for women in Latin America, it's the worst in the world. And so as you are addressing some of these issues, and, and thank you for raising the idea that it, hope is what they're lacking, because I think some of the programming that ProMujer and others are doing, that's what they're providing. It's hope to be able to remain at home yep. because they don't want to have to leave their home. So Carmen, talk to us about what ProMujer Pro is doing. Um, to overcome some of those obstacles that women are facing. Mm -hmm. And particularly when we're thinking about gender instruments that are tailored, how can they be tailored more effectively to really reach women? Yeah, thank you, Charity, for the introduction. And as Rebecca was, was stating, it's very important to be working in partnerships. We have been working in Latin America for more than 32 years now, giving access to low-income women to financial services, financial inclusion, mm -hmm. also skilling and education, and also access to health services. Right now, what we have seen, and almost everybody here knows, is that a charity was sharing with us, if we include more women in the economy, we will have better results, better, better economic results. So it's not just the, the way we should do it because it's the right thing to do, but it's because we will have better economic results. And actually what we have seen is that still now we have only 50% of women participating in the economy, while men we still have 69%. Mm -hmm. Women, we are earning less money, 20% less than men in the same position. So it's very important to be working in partnerships. And what we have seen and learned in these 32 years is that actually we have to adapt our products, our services to the women we serve. It's not just what Carmen or Promujer decides it's necessary. We have to listen to these women. We have to be there with the feet on the ground and actually learn about their needs. And there are not the same needs. For example, a woman in Chiapas won't have the same needs because she haven't lived the same experiences that a woman living in Buenos Aires, Argentina. So we have to understand that we need to adapt the services we provide to them. It would be the same if, for example, we think about financial inclusion and also l the labor market, because it won't be the same for someone, middle class, white, that it's not actually uh, representative or actually she doesn't feel like being part of an ethnic group she will have the same restraints and the same actually challenges that a woman that maybe is a low income poverty woman that it's facing actually in, in, in totally different aspects how she can access financial services. So it's key to adapt the, the products and services, it's key to uh, look into these intersectionalities and see how you can serve better serve these women. Mm -hmm. That's so important. It's really to know the differences. We've talked about the differences between rural and rur rural mm -hmm. settings, the differences be and how those interventions are different and tailored to them, which is mm -hmm. really critical. And, it, and as we think about the audience here and what they can be doing as far as investments, that's really important. And so that goes to you, Hector. So um, really thinking about what Google.org has taken on um, as the private sector so critical actually to addressing and solving some of the the, lar the world's largest challenges. Um, you know, what are you doing to address um, the drivers, the economic drivers of migration and talk a little bit about your um, working with ProMujer? Happy to. So first of all, let me start by acknowledging the fact that I'm so lucky to be sitting on this stage with these wonderful powerhouse women. And um, I'm hopeful that this is just a preview of what leadership stages will look like more and more into the future. So <laughs> let me just set that up. Um, and you know, the, the, the reason why I lead with that is, you know, we, we can acknowledge that over the last decade we've been making a lot of progress and we've been working very proactively mm -hmm. towards bridging gender gaps, but there's still a lot of work to be done. We saw throughout the pandemic that women were twice as likely to be displaced from a job than men. We also saw throughout the pandemic that girls were less likely to return to school mm -hmm. after schools reopened than their male counterparts. 
And we also acknowledge that women are key, key to the economic stability of regions. Mm -hmm. And if we're thinking about forced migration, if we're thinking about some of the drivers that force people out when they don't, they don't want to be leaving their homes, mm -hmm. right? They want to be staying local. Um, that tends to be drivers around economic instability. Mm -hmm. And that's why we at Google.org have been so focused on supporting women. Because we acknowledge that when women and girls have the opportunity and the resources to turn their economic potential into power, they not only benefit and change their lives, we also change the fabric of entire societies and entire communities. So historically, over the past uh, 10 years, Google.org has invested over $50 million in Latin America alone with a deep lens into economic mobility and economic opportunity for women. And we know that that's not, 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 uh, not enough. And that's why a few weeks back at the Summit of the Americas, my CEO, Sundar Pichai, announced a $1.2 billion commitment to the region over the next five years. Of that $1.2 billion, $300 million is going to be a commitment from Google.org, which is going to have a specific focus around supporting the gender gap and supporting women to have greater access to economic opportunity over the next few years. So we're incredibly proud of that work. And one key component of that work is, of course, the work we're doing with Promo Hair and with Carbon, which really centers and focuses on the Northern Triangle. It centers and focuses on how do we, how can we be the most responsive to the challenges that are leading to economic instability in the region? And how do we do so through a lens that serve, services women in different different sectors, right? Whether they be urban or rural, whether they be indigenous or non-indigenous. So we really want to be catering to, to, these, dif to th these different drivers. Um, when it comes to digital, when it comes to tech, when it comes to the role of the digital economy, I think we can all acknowledge that the way that the economy has been moving over the past several decades is in an increasingly technical and increasingly digital way. We know that throughout the pandemic, when, when the pandemic started, that really accelerated a lot of these drivers, whether it be greater automation of work, whether it be distance learning, whether it be remote work. These are all trends that are being accelerated. And inherently, these are trends that are net good. They're going to be net positive to society. They're going to create greater efficiency. They're going to create better businesses. They're going to create better livelihoods for people. But one thing that we have to also acknowledge within this mix is that it also has the potential to drive greater inequality if we're not incredibly intentional and diligent in addressing the factors that are keeping individuals out of opportunity and out of participating in the promise of the digital economy. If we're looking at this through the lens of work, for example, we know that 90% of jobs are going to require at least a baseline understanding of digital skills by 2030. Mm -hmm. We also know that a majority of individuals gain those skills through a four-year university or institution. And we also know that one in five individuals in Latin America has access to a four-year university or institution. Mm -hmm. That is a tremendous gap. That is a tremendous gap that needs to be addressed. That's what we're working with organizations like Pro Mujer. That's what we're working with organizations in the region like Laboratoria, Glasswing International, International Youth Foundation, and the like, to really help provide alternate pathways to offer mobility, alternate pathways to economic opportunity, whether that be in digital economy jobs through credentialing. We have an entire suite of credentials at the Google, which are called the Google Career Certificates, uh, that we've been deploying alongside of wraparound support. So I also want to acknowledge that many of these individuals have multiple barriers to employment. We're working with these institutions, best in class organizations to remove those barriers, whether it be childcare credits, whether it be a living stipend so that these mothers and these women don't have to work multiple jobs, can actually reskill and upskill, or whether it be the good work we're doing with Promo Hair to really center on providing these women with capital and center on providing these women with the skills they need to be competitive in the digital economy. Yeah, it's amazing really to think about. And so when you're thinking about closing the gap, I would just love for you to like practically, how do you do that? And what partnerships are something that we've talked a lot about, the importance mm -hmm. of partnerships. Concordia <clears throat> talks so much about partnerships. It's really um, underpins a lot mm -hmm. of the work that they do at Concordia, public-private partnerships, NGO, private sector partnerships. 
they're key to solving the most challenging issues as we know. So talk a little bit more maybe about the partnership piece. Carmen, you may want to talk about that a little bit and then Hector. But you know, just talking even the practical like application of how this partnership works in the drivers. Well, actually in this case, we are working with Google in the Northern Triangle. With this help and support of Google, we are able to deploy much more easily and much more rapidly, and we will be able to reach m much more women in the Northern Triangle, and we will be able to deploy not only financial services, but also provide the skills and also that those capacities that are needed in those women to develop their own companies. Mm -hmm. These partnerships are key because they allow us to not only deploy some pilots or deploy some services, but also allow us to be more efficient in how we do it because we are also incorporating the knowledge that Google brings in. It's not just the funds, but it's also the knowledge. It's also the network that will help us. So these partnerships for the NGOs and social enterprise is our key because they don't only allow us to develop the programs, but they allow us to be open to new networks and they allow us also to actually reach much more impact and have much more impact in, in a shorter period of time. Mm. Additionally, what we have seen is that we are much more stronger in getting out, out the word and letting people know about how we are working and actually bringing more and other potential partners to be working in this region. It will attract more investors to be working not only with Promujer, but also with other organizations that are working, in this case, in the Northern Triangle. So Promujer is working at the regional level we are concentrating much of our effort in this region because the, that, that region that is the Northern Triangle, that is Guatemala, Honduras and El Salvador, is where women are much more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It's where we have seen that there is a much more need for the type of services that we provide. And of course, we are going to be working not only with international organizations and corporations, but also with the local organizations that are already working in the country and have been working in the country for many years. Amazing. Hector, anything to add? Yeah, you know, I mean, I want, one, I want to emphasize what, what Carmen just shared and, and why, this, why this access to capital work is so relevant and important. You know, if we look across the spectrum of, of Latin America and the role of SMBs, the role of small and medium-sized businesses, we know that over 85% of the workforce is employed in small and medium-sized businesses. Yeah. That is critical, right? That's a critical driver of economic stability and wealth and upper mobility in the region. We also know that 75% of women-led SMBs lack access to capital mm -hmm. to sustain a small business, start a small business, grow a small business, and, um, and to us, that's, that's really critical, right? Like if we're thinking about the role that women play in economic stability, we're thinking about how they're oftentimes marginalized and locked out of accessing capital, mm -hmm. especially in geographies like Central America and the Northern Triangle, where we have over 300,000 individuals that are internally displaced, over half a million individuals that have been forced to migrate out in pursuit of greater economic opportunity. That is, that is incredibly dire, and we know that philanthropy and the private sector can't do this, can't address this alone, which is why we oftentimes really approach this work at google.org through the lens of partnerships and then the lens of collaboration. That's why we really look to civil society that are the most proximate to, to these issues, mm -hmm. that have the, the, the greatest uh, lived experience, that are led by individuals that reflect the communities that they're serving. That's what we're really targeting that, that type of organization with our funding. We're also really intentional about ensuring that we can bring our greater ecosystem of government relationships and you know, international organization relationships to bear. Uh, when we initially deployed the Google Career Certificates in Latin America, we did so in deep partnership and collaboration with the Inter-American Development Bank because we knew that they would also bring to the table a layer of expertise, a layer of relationships with governments that we as an institution lacked. So again, at the forefront of any meaningful and successful initiative is deep cross-sectional partnerships. Yeah, I think that's really a, cre a key 
component of it is, you know, as partners, we each bring our own resources, skills, trusted networks, to your point, mm -hmm. there's a greater ability to have larger networks and expand our networks. But it's each one of us bring a value add that's different and unique, and every partner will play a very significant role, but they're not all gonna play the same role, which mm -hmm. is actually, obviously, the critical part of partnerships. <laughs> um, so as we conclude, let's talk about, I'm very action oriented as we've talked about. So why don't we talk to the audience? What's a call to action for the audience? What would you say? What would you want them to take away? So each one of you would love for you to answer, but Rebecca, I'll start with you. What's your call to action? Sure. Well, my call to action is to get involved with groups like Pro Mujer, the dialogue. I mean, there's so many civil society groups and um, kind of action oriented groups here. Um, I'd say get involved. And I'll just say really quickly um, about the Inter-American Dialogue and partnerships. So you mentioned the partnership with the IDB. So we've been working with CAF Development Bank on creating a cities initiative, mm -hmm. um, kind of looking at the importance of looking at the municipal level for, for solutions. And we hosted a summit on the margins of a mayor's summit on the summit of the broader um, summit of the Americas where we focused on migration. And we had mayors like Claudia Lopez of Bogota. We had um, the mayor of Upala, Costa Rica, where they're dealing with the Nicaraguans. We had mayors from the United States, San Antonio, Eric Garcetti was there. And you know, at that and during that particular conference, we focused on migration, but out of that conference, we decided that what we need to do next is have focus on gender mm. and women's empowerment at the municipal level. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you, if um, you're interested, to, to get involved in that. We think that really local level solutions are more important than ever mm -hmm. when we see this kind of gridlock in many of um, national governments um, across the Americas. And the other thing I would say is just always keep in mind that um, migration is a region-wide problem. Um, it's not just the U.S. southern border, which is critical, mm -hmm. um, but um, I'm glad the summit, we acknowledge that this yeah. is a hemisphere-wide, but we've got 6.1 million Venezuelans. We, got, we have the issue with Nicaraguans. Right. We have Haitians. So um, I think also, you know, if you're thinking about how to act, keep in mind that this is a hemisphere-wide challenge, and um, no single actor is going to be able to um, address it alone. That's right. So. Exactly. That's right. Which is why we need those partnerships. Yep. It's no single actor, actor can do it alone. Carmen, call to action. Call to action will be incorporate a gender perspective. It doesn't matter if you are from the public sector, private sector, civil society, incorporate that gender perspective. And the other call to action is don't try to reinvent anything. Mm -hmm. Most of the things are out there. So try to collaborate, try to work with others, try to partner because it will be much better. That's right. Hector? I think my call to action is primarily for funders and people with, with pools of money, right? I think focusing on the most marginalized is incredibly important, one. Two is really leaning to proximity. So again, looking for organizations, leaders, institutions that are deeply proximate to the issue and really proximate to community is really important. And three, pay attention to the nuances, right? Like not, there's not one size fits all solution for these right. really difficult issues. They are incredibly nuanced. The differences between what women need if they come from a rural or urban setting are vastly different. If they come from an indigenous background, they're vastly different. The languages are vastly different across the region and in Central America in particular. So I think that's something that we have to keep, those three uh, factors are things that we have to keep centering ourselves in. Absolutely, really great. So thank you all so much. I hope everyone enjoyed our, um, our conversation today. I hope that we leave with some ideas for how we might be able to take action, how we might be able to partner together, um, including that you know, integrating that gender lens into all that we're doing. And so I just want to thank you all for your time and for the amazing work that each one of you are doing. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you.